These two clues are critically important because they tell us plainly, clearly, that this is an end times prophecy. It's not something that's happened in ancient history. It's something that will happen one day. How can we unpack the mysteries of the coming war of Gog and Magog found in Ezekiel 38 and 39? God did not put prophecy in the Bible to be skipped and ignored. God's not trying to hide the truth from you. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund, and today we present Joel's insights again into the War of Gog and Magog and the five other nations that join forces with Gog. Here's Joel. One of the most important prophecies regarding the end of days is known as the War of Gog and Magog. Found in the writings of the ancient Hebrew prophet Ezekiel in chapters 38 and 39 of the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, it's a prophecy deeply important to the Jewish people, as many believe that the events it describes will come to pass just before Messiah comes to Jerusalem for the first time. Now, the War of Gog and Magog is also a prophecy that's deeply important to Christians. Why? Because many Bible scholars believe that the events that Ezekiel describes will take place before the second coming of the Messiah right here in Jerusalem. And because there's another version of the War of Gog and Magog that's described in chapter 20 of the New Testament book of Revelation. But the War of Gog and Magog is also deeply important to Muslims. Why? Because in Islamic eschatology, there is yet another version of the prophecy known in Arabic as the War of Yajuj and Majuj, found in chapters 18 and 21 of the Quran. Now, because the biblical prophecy found in Ezekiel's writings is so detailed and so important, and its implications for mankind are so profound, we're going to unpack it over the course of the next several videos. Like good journalists and detectives, we're going to ask who, what, when, where, why, and how. Today, I want to begin in Ezekiel chapter 38. We'll start with verses 1 through 3, and I'm using the New American Standard translation. As the Hebrew prophet tells us, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. Now I get it. Many people stop right there and go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm out. Why? Because the words they encounter in these first few verses are so strange and unfamiliar. So people get nervous and they think that they won't be able to understand what God is saying. But that's a mistake. You absolutely can understand the basic trajectory of this enormously important Bible prophecy without having a PhD in theology or ancient Hebrew. Let me show you how. First, don't worry about the specific names just yet. Yes, I realize they're archaic and confusing, so let's get back to them in a bit. For now, let's just take a deep breath, slow down, don't let yourself get flustered, and don't give up. Second, start jotting down notes uh, of what you see as plain and completely understandable in the text, okay? That's important. Ezekiel begins by writing that the word of the Lord came to him and spoke. Okay, that's important. This isn't a work of fiction. It's not a novel written by Ezekiel. It's not a work of speculation by Ezekiel. It's not a work of Islamic eschatology written 3,000 years later either. No, this is the very word of God. This is truth spoken by the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, through one of his trusted messengers. Now, what exactly does God say to Ezekiel? Let's pick up the text. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Again, don't panic, okay? Don't get flustered. Just create a section in your notebook for who. 
And in that section, write down the word Gog. Okay, what do we know about him? Let's, let's create some bullet points under this word Gog. Okay, just by looking at the first few verses, we can see that he's some sort of political leader, right? We see that he's described as a prince, a ruler. He's over a land called Magog. Good, write that down. He's a political leader. He's a prince over Magog. Next, we see that this territory called Magog also includes places called Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. Good, write that down as well. What else is plain and clear in the text? Well, the text tells us that God is not happy with this political leader, right? In verse 2, God says to Ezekiel, set your face toward Gog and prophesy against him. Then in verse 3, God says, behold, I'm against you. Right? O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. This is critical. God, with a D, is against Gog with a G. That's not hard to understand, right? So write that down. Gog, with a G, is an enemy of God, with a D. God is against Gog. And Ezekiel is told to prophesy against Gog. Now, skip down for a moment and look at verse 10. God says to Gog, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise what? An evil plan. Well, that's clear and important as well, right? So write it down. Gog will devise an evil plan. Gog is clearly one of the Bible bad guys. Okay, so already a clear picture is emerging of who this Gog character is. Now, it's time to ask, what is Gog going to do? What is this evil plan that Gog is going to devise and execute? As we study verses 4 through 12, we see the plan begin to unfold. Verse 4 tells us that Gog is a military leader. Be sure to write that down under who. He's a military leader. But under what? Note that Gog is going to mobilize all, not some, but all, of his military forces. Quote, I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and I will bring you out and all of your army, horses and horsemen and all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords. But we also learn that Gog will not be acting alone. Rather, it turns out that not only is he a ruler of a specific land, Uh, He's also a geopolitical leader, and he's building a military coalition made up of forces from other countries. Be sure to write that down under who. Now we need to add some other bullet points under who. Who are the other nations that are involved in this military coalition? Five are mentioned in verses five and six, okay? The first nation mentioned is Persia. The second one mentioned is described in the New American Standard Bible as Ethiopia. But the Hebrew word that's actually used here is the word Cush. So I'd recommend writing down the word Cush and putting Ethiopia in parenthesis next to it, and we'll get back to that in a bit. The third nation mentioned is Put. And the text tells us that all three of these nations will deploy their military forces with shield and helmet. The fourth nation involved in Gog's evil plan is known as Gomer with all its troops. The fifth nation mentioned is Beth Togarma, uh, or the House of Togarma, which is also described as coming with all of its troops and with many peoples with you. Verse 7 gives us more information about what Gog is going to do. I particularly appreciate the New International Version uh, translation of this verse. It reads this way. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. Look, it's easy to get distracted by all the complicated ancient names, but the narrative here is crystal clear. Gog is an evil dictator. He devises an evil plan. The plan involves his military, but it also involves the armies of at least five other nations. Gog's job is to get that coalition ready, to get those military forces ready, and to take command of them in a unified fashion in order to attack someone. Now, at this point, we still don't know 
uh, who or what the target of the attack is. But we find out in verse 8. Actually, verse 8 gives us several important details to fill in on our chart. For starters, we get our first time reference. The text tells us that this attack is going to happen in the latter years. Write that down under the section when. Okay? Now, skip down to verse 16 and we get another time reference. It shall come about in the last days. Definitely write that down under when as well. These two clues are critically important because they tell us plainly, clearly, that this is an end times prophecy. It's not something that's happened in ancient history. It's something that will happen one day. One day in the future, in the end of days, in the last days, in the latter times. Good. Okay, so we're making progress, right? Now let's go back to verse 8. Here, God says to Gog, After many days you will be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, bing, there it is, which had been a continual waste. But its people were brought out from the nations, and they're all living securely, all of them. Bing. Again, there it is. In verse 8, God makes it clear what the target is going to be. What, what is God going after? What's his evil plan focused on in the last days? Israel, a nation whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations. The text makes it crystal clear that Israel is a land that had been a continual waste, but now its people, the Jewish people, my people, have been brought out from the nations. That is brought back from living all over the world in exile, and they've resettled right here in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel. Verse 12 tells us that the Jewish people are being regathered to live where? At the center of the world. That's an interesting phrase, the center of the world. In Hebrew, the word center is tabur, which literally means navel or belly button. Okay? Write that down in the where section of your chart. See, God doesn't just see Israel as some other country just among all the countries of the world. No, 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 no. God says that he's put Israel at the center, at the navel, at the belly button of the earth. And that's one of the reasons that I call Israel the epicenter of the world. Another reason I, I do that is because of Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5. Quote, Thus says the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. See, I've set her at the center of the nations. This couldn't be clearer. And that's why I titled my first nonfiction book, Epicenter, because Israel is the dead center, the heart, the soul of God's plan and purpose for the world. And in Epicenter, I walked readers through Ezekiel's prophecies in great detail because they're so important, not just for Jews, definitely for Jews, but also for Christians, indeed for everyone on earth. What happens here in Israel, and particularly in the city of Jerusalem, has profound implications for all of mankind, especially in these last days. And we ignore these prophecies at our peril. So, we can now fill in several more sections of our chart. Go back to the section of who. Under who, note that Gog is targeting the Jewish people with his evil plan. Under what? Note that Gog is preparing to invade the resurrected and reborn sovereign state of Israel. Under where, note that Israel is the epicenter of the world and that the land of Israel is center stage for these prophecies when they unfold. And under when, note that the text makes it clear that before Ezekiel 38 and 39 can happen, before the war of Gog and Magog can come to pass, Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37 must come to pass first. Those chapters, of course, include the most famous prophecies in all of the Bible about the miraculous, dramatic rebirth of the sovereign state of Israel, the ingathering of the Jewish people from all the nations of the earth, the deserts blooming again, and the Jews rebuilding our ancient ruins right here in the land of Israel. That's why in the last video that we produced for the Bible Prophecy Project, we looked at Ezekiel 37, the prophecy regarding the Valley of the Dry Bones. 
If you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch it with family and friends. You'll see what the prophecy says, what it means, and that sure enough, over the last hundred years or so, God has been bringing Ezekiel 37 to pass in our lifetime. It's amazing. I mean, just think about how astonishing it is. We now live in the days when the Jewish people are being miraculously and dramatically regathered to the promised land from all the nations of the world. It's still happening. It happened with my family. We now live in an age when the sovereign state of Israel has been miraculously reborn, rebuilt, resurrected from the ashes and ruins of the Holocaust and the terrors of World Wars I and II. And that's why it's so important that we now turn our attention to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Because as each item on God's prophetic checklist gets checked off, we need to understand the next set of end times prophecies that will also come to pass. That's why in our next video, we'll embark on some exciting historical detective work. We're going to discover where these ancient biblical names like Magog, Rosh, Meshech, Tubal, Persia, Cush, Put, Gomer, and Beth Togarma, where do they come from? Where do those names come from? And what modern countries do they actually refer to? We'll learn more about the evil plan that this Gog figure is plotting to unleash against Israel and how this apocalyptic prophecy will literally affect every person on earth. For now, though, I just want to ask you, are, are you getting all of this? Are, are you writing it down? Can you see how many important details in these two chapters of Ezekiel uh, that you've actually been able to understand, even though, admittedly, you don't yet know which countries will be involved in attacking Israel? Are you discovering that I wasn't kidding when I promised that if you slow down and take a deep breath and look at the text very slowly and carefully, you really can understand the gist of what God is saying, even in some of the Bible's most complicated passages? Good, because this is one of the most important lessons in studying Bible prophecy. You can do it. Let me say that again. You can do it. It's not impossible. God isn't trying to hide the truth from you. True, he doesn't intend to tell us about every single event that's going to happen in every single country in every single season of world history. But there are certain events in certain countries that are going to happen at certain times in the future that he absolutely wants us to be aware of and truly understand. The miraculous rebirth of the sovereign state of Israel, as ascribed in the prophecies of Ezekiel 36 and 37, after centuries of exile, is definitely one of those things he wants us to understand. The coming war of Gog and Magog, as described in the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39, is another. That first set of prophecies was wonderful and encouraging. The second set is, to be very honest, very, very sobering. But we dare not ignore them because they're not a bunch of guesses designed to scare us. They're a bunch of promises from Almighty God designed to prepare us. And that, my friend, is the purpose and the power of Bible prophecy. Our verse of the day today is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Our prayer requests today are to pray for the nation of Israel and the people of the Middle East, that they would come to know God in great numbers in these last days. And second, pray that more and more pastors, seminaries, churches, and just people in the United States and throughout the world will understand the importance of prophecy and why it should be taught. Well, thank you for listening to this episode and understanding a little bit more of the prophecies around the war of Gog and Magog and why Israel is at the very epicenter of world history. If you found this podcast valuable, please get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Do you want to know something else on this show? Do you want to have a question for Joel to answer? Send any comments you may have. 
to podcast at joshuafund.net. Your feedback is incredibly valuable to us as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.